Good evening. Um, I'm really, really happy to see you all here tonight, and I'm really pleased to start this first conference series on um, the Middle East and uh, North Africa. Uh, so tonight we are really lucky and grateful to have with us two amazing guests that I met just a, a few weeks ago when I was visiting the ICC in, uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, so Moussa Mahmoudi um, is uh, from Afghanistan, he just arrived yesterday actually uh, from Kabul. He's the executive director of the Afghan uh, human rights um, organization and uh, we have uh, Nima Nanania, who is uh, the prosecutor at the International Criminal Court in uh, the Netherlands. So without any further ado, we're going to actually, you know, I will leave you maybe the floor to start to explain a little bit what you're doing at the ICC and what you're doing uh, at the Af Afghan Human Rights Commission. And then, well, maybe just start, you know, a very informal discussion. So please, first, a round of applause for our guests. So I, I guess it's on me to begin. So let me make two preliminary points before I get into um, just a brief description about our preliminary examinations into Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, first, let me just express how much of an honor it is to be here at NYU Florence, NYU, sorry, uh, European University Institute, and even a greater honor to be here with Mr. Mahmoudi uh, because it's truly, I mean, it's very, I cannot emphasize how difficult his job is and how amazing the work that they do in the African Human Rights Commission is. The second point I want to make is uh, I'm a trial attorney, not the prosecutor. So before my, my, my boss actually fires me for taking over her position, let me just clarify that. What I intend to do very briefly for the next, uh, I think, five to seven minutes is outline our examinations in Iraq and in Afghanistan. And I'm, I'm being very specific when I use the word examination as opposed to the word investigation, as well as as the word trial. Because at the ICC, we have several stages when looking into situations to determine whether crimes have occurred, whether we have jurisdiction over those crimes, and when we should institute prosecutions over those crimes. In many situations, the first thing we do is conduct what we call a preliminary examination. And that is a determination before we even decide to investigate as to whether or not, one, we believe that uh, what has happened in those situations uh, amounted to crimes that are in the jurisdiction of the court. So war crimes, crimes against humanity, the crime of genocide, and now recently the crime of aggression. During those examinations, we also determine whether or not uh, there is uh, admissibility, the admiss admissibility requirements have been, have been met, and that is whether we have jurisdiction over the matter, as well as whether or not uh, national authorities are themselves prosecuting similar conduct in their own jurisdictions. And, and the reason we look into that is because the court, that is the ICC, is not a court of first instance. It is a court that is intended to complement, not circumvent, uh, prosecutions and investigations by national authorities. So if, for instance, national authorities are themselves investigating or prosecuting, then we'll take a step back and allow them to conduct their prosecutions um, and we'll only intervene if we believe that they are not investigating cases that we have an interest in or if they themselves want us to take over those investigations and prosecutions. So that's, a, that's what we do during the preliminary examination stage. And it's only until we are satisfied that we have subject matter jurisdiction, that is the crimes under our jurisdiction have been met or, or, or likely to be, or have been committed, and uh, jurisdiction and admissibility, that we take uh, a, the further step and request authorization to conduct an investigation. So why do we have this bifurcated structure? Well, it's, it's principally a matter of resources. The fact of the matter remains is that our office isn't as big as we would like it to be. And we get a number of inquiries and requests to conduct investigations, as you can imagine, <coughs> all over the world. And so the only way we can ensure that our resources are going to those circumstances where there is a credible claim, and a claim that rises to the gravity threshold uh, necessary for it to meet the definition of what an international crime is, 
is by conducting a preliminary examination. And that now brings me to what's going on with regards to our evaluation of the situations in Afghanistan and in Iraq. And I use the word situation also very uh, specifically because we haven't identified individuals to prosecute yet or to even investigate yet. We are simply looking at whether or not crimes have been committed and generally speaking, what organizations or institutions are responsible for those crimes or we believe could be responsible for those crimes. So first in the context of Afghanistan, um, and by the way, everything I say can be found in more detail in reports that are available on our website, which go into detail as to the nature of these examinations and specifically the types of crimes that we're looking into. But as it relates to Afghanistan, we're looking ostensibly at three different institutions. And all three for, for crimes that occurred during, uh, during the initial onslaught uh, of the war that occurred following September 11th, but up until as late as, as, late as excuse me, last year. And we're looking at the conduct of anti-Afghan government forces, such as the Taliban. We're looking at the conduct of pro-government forces in detention centers located around Afghanistan. And we're looking at the conduct of international forces, uh, such as the, the US government and the US military for detention centers throughout Afghanistan as well. So these are the three sub-crimes or the sub-circumstances that we're looking at in the Afghan situation. And we can discuss in detail the specific incidents that we're looking at in, in light uh, of those actors. The second situation that is the subject of this discussion is Iraq. And for Iraq, we're looking at only one specific circumstance, which is the conduct of UK forces in Iraq um, with regards to detention centers that they had custody and control over. And the reason for that is due to jurisdictional limitations. The, the, the court itself only can exercise jurisdiction in three circumstances. One is if the, if the Security Council under its Chapter 7 power authorizes us to conduct investigations into certain states, such as in Sudan and Libya, irrespective of whether those states or national of those states are parties to the statute of the court. The second circumstance, and this is where Afghanistan falls into place, is where the state itself, that is the state where the allegation of a crime has occurred in, has ratified the statute, in which case we have jurisdiction over any of the individuals who are alleged to have committed crimes in the territory of that state. So for instance, in the context of Afghanistan, we're looking into the conduct of US forces, even though the United States is not a party to the Rome statute, because the alleged conduct occurred in the territory of a, of a state party to the statute, i.e. Afghanistan. And the third circumstance is when the allegation is against a national of a country that has ratified the Rome statute. And that's, that's where the Iraq situation comes into play. Because the Iraqi government has not ratified the statute, but the UK government has. So while we don't have jurisdiction over the conduct of US forces in Iraq, or even Iraqi forces in Iraq, because the United Kingdom has accepted the jurisdiction of our court, we do have jurisdiction over the conduct of UK forces in Iraq. And so that's, in, that's important to understand when you're trying to ask yourselves um, why just the UK forces in Iraq and why not the US forces or why not the Iraqi government or why not other non-state forces in Iraq? Why limit yourself just to the UK? And that's all due to jurisdictional limitations that we have. Um, I can continue on, obviously. Uh, there's a lot, to talk, a lot to talk about in terms of these situations, but I'll reserve my comments on them in, in response to questions posed by Sophie or... Um, so actually, um, I wanted to, to turn to you, Musa. Um, and from the point of view of, of Afghani internal politics, could you just tell us what would be the impact of an ICC investigation, proper investigation in Afghanistan? Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, let me thank you and thank you for, you for uh, the invitation. I'm such a honor to be here at the presence of you and uh, the trial uh, lawyer, uh, my friend, 
Nima Milania, Milanina, sorry. Uh, uh, let me express this one that uh, dealing with uh, uh, war crimes in Afghanistan has been very challenging and difficult issue. It's both uh, a politically a challenge issue and also because of the capacity of the government of Afghanistan a challenging issue and because there are so many forces, so many groups, so many elements are involved, it's, it's very challenging issues. The Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission that I'm the executive director of it started a, uh, an initiative that we called Transitional Justice and that uh, was covering a period of war, um, you know, atrocities, human rights violations and war crimes that happened and committed uh, during uh, uh, nine, uh, 1978 and 2001, and that involved, uh, you know, Soviet uh, Union-backed uh, regime, uh, communist regime, uh, the Civil War era, and uh, uh, Taliban um, uh, uh, government. And that was an issue that we wanted when we hoped that it would start. Uh, uh, an opening for uh, establishing justice in Afghanistan for a long time and for a period that uh, it ensured peace and uh, uh, guarantees uh, a sustainable peace for Afghanistan and also provide uh, an assurances that it would not reoccur and it would open up for a, uh, a criminal investigation on the cases and incidents that happened during that period, and also, you know, open up opportunities for compensation and for reconciliation. Unfortunately, because of the challenging issues that I just uh, mentioned to you, uh, those issues were not very much, uh, you know, supported neither by the government of Afghanistan nor by the international community. Now there are a few issues that may impact the. Uh, uh, investigation of ICC and that's very much the discussion of those issues. First, because there are so little awareness and understanding of the ICC role and ICC uh, procedures, uh, ICC uh, jurisdiction, uh, those who belong to the, those three periods of time, they are very afraid that ICC involvement in Afghanistan case would open up, you know, investigation against those who were, uh, you know, accused or uh, culprits of crimes that committed during that specific period of time. However, we know that the jurisdiction of ICC would not, not go, uh, you know, uh, before 2003 that Afghanistan acceded to the ICC. The second very important issue in Afghanistan is that uh, the, the parliament of Afghanistan and uh, uh, the government of Afghanistan passed an amnesty law. And that amnesty law, unfortunately, uh, disappointed many victims and many people in Afghanistan. Uh, and that is a, 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 a very, very uh, challenging obstacle in the way of, of justice. The third issue that uh, this would be seen as an impact politically is that Afghanistan a government has started a peace process with the Taliban and anti-government forces. Uh, there is a fear that uh, opening up ICC would deter or, uh, you know, uh, 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 frighten uh, the the Taliban forces. That it would the ICC would open up, you know, and have uh, uh, are being used as an instrument against the the Taliban. In, in the wake of you know, a peace negotiation that, uh, that started between Afghanistan and Pakistan, supported by the United States and uh, China, the two uh, superpowers in that region. Nonetheless, there is a strong will uh, from the civil society of Afghanistan, from the victim of Afghanistan, uh, victim uh, of human rights violations in Afghanistan, uh, human rights organizations, uh, Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission, to make sure that 
ICC could you know, ex uh, examine the situation and help to restore justice in a country that will have been uh, destroyed by mo over three decades of war and uh, uh, f in fighting between different uh, factions and also the involvement of the international uh, troops in Afghanistan. So that's, uh, that's a hope. And, and we started just a negotiation with the government of Afghanistan to allow uh, the ICC to, to visit Afghanistan. And I think that is uh, something that is under discussions and under uh, debate there internally. And we hope that it will provide and facilitate a, a visit by ICC to, to do that. But the situation, without involvement of ICC, the situation would remain very, very uh, difficult for promotion and protection of human rights. Nowadays that I'm talking here, uh, we don't have electricity in Kabul because the power plants were, uh, and the, the, the uh, electricity were cut off by Taliban. Uh, we just had a, a statement yesterday condemning killing of four uh, vaccine, uh, you know, medical uh, aids who were just delivering to children uh, the polio vaccine. Uh, we had the killing of Hazara ethnicities in Zabul province that killed by, by Taliban. A few days ago, Taliban uh, detonated a bomb, uh, a suicide bombing, and killed uh, six, uh, uh, seven uh, journalists and injured 20 of them. The other day, they killed over 18 people in Kabul, just you know, on Wednesday. So this kind of onslaught is going on by Taliban, and the same things are happening you know, sometimes by uh, uh, the uh, lack of capacity or lack of political will. Uh, by the international troops, the issue of attacking a hospital in Kunduz is, you know, uh, uh, an example. Uh, the killing of people inside Abad, and so many other incidents that we register uh, uh, as a human rights organization that we have uh, monitoring pow uh, power and mandate by Constitution of Afghanistan. So, um, what is actually the the role that you're really that you could be playing in this first part of examination and then maybe in the investigation? Would you be able to really collaborate with the... The, the commission is... Um, Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission is a constitutionally mandated uh, uh, commission. It's independent from the government, from the judiciary, from a legislation, uh, legislative body, but it's state, it is a state entity. So it's uh, established based par on Paris principle. We have a broad mandate. We could uh, monitor human rights uh, violations, including a violation of international humanitarian law. Uh, for that purpose, we uh, uh, established a unit that we call the Special uh, Investigation Unit, and that always uh, monitor and investigate uh, cases that happens because of uh, the conflict, uh, the ongoing conflict in Afghanistan. So the only credible, I think, uh, other than a United uh, Nations organization that they put also reports and uh, you know, collect information and data on those issues, I think nationally the uh, Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission is the only organization that monitor, register, uh, in depending on the availability of resources and the capacity, investigate cases uh, and incidents that happened, uh, uh, happens in Afghanistan. Uh, and that includes that we put a report annually uh, about the civilian casualties or issues of target killing or uh, reports that, uh, for instance, that we put on attacking of uh, Taliban and, and occupying Kunduz. Uh, so we have uh, trained uh, lawyers and investigators. We have uh, uh, a specific methodology to uh, look into those incidents and investigate and examine them and collect information and data and testimonies on those issues. And those things could help in the investigation of the ICC if they start to look into Afghanistan and examine the situation. That's pretty much uh, what we can do and we are not a judiciary or quasi-judiciary institution so our power is very limited other than those issues. 
So actually, um, what are you exactly looking at? What kind of incidents, accidents are you are you looking at um, during mm -hmm. this preliminary investigation? I mean, during the during the, for instance, we'll take the the the, the situation in Afghanistan. Um, the situations, the specific situations that we're looking at are threefold. Uh, one is with regards to the Taliban or anti-government forces, we're looking at a number of situations such as targeted killings which have increased in frequency. We're looking at um, situations in which there's disproportionate attacks. Um, so there's a fundamental rule of international humanitarian law which is although Although there's uh, what they call combatants immunity, which is if you're fighting in a, in a, in a, in a war, uh, usually if you're a, a member of the military on one side, you have combatants immunity, which makes sense. Um, but if the attack is disproportionate, for instance, or if you're targeting civilians, then you've committed a crime which is ostensibly a war crime. So we're looking at those types of situations as well, which is attacks between pro-government and anti-government forces where we believe that civilians were targeted and killed or civilians were the subject of disproportionate attacks. Now, when it comes to pro-government forces, we're looking at similar situations, such as the disproportionate attacks, but we're also looking at um, detention centers uh, and, and specifically conditions in detention centers and whether or not the treatment of detainees rises to such a level that we believe that a crime against humanity or a war crime has been committed. Similarly, with regards to international forces, which is we're looking at circumstances in which we believe, uh, not we believe, but which, for instance, information coming to us suggests that uh, international forces may be responsible for the commission of, of war crimes again or crimes against humanity. And the way, uh, at least at this stage in the proceedings, the way we collect information or look at information is largely through information that is presented to us by non-governmental organizations, by, um, by government institutions themselves, including international forces and the government of Afghanistan, and not so much through any of what you would suggest as your classic investigative tools, such as the collection of documentation, interviewing victims and witnesses, and so on. And, and the reason for that is, again, because this is a preliminary examination, it is not an investigation. So we are not dedicating what we would argue, or what is known to be, as investigative resources. What we're doing is simply doing an examination on the basis of information that is readily available to us, and which we can procure through our conversations with different stakeholders, assessing the credibility of that information, and then making a determination as to whether or not we believe there's a reasonable basis to proceed, or that, excuse me, a reasonable basis to believe that a crime within the jurisdiction of the court has been, and has been committed. At that stage, what we'll do is seek authorization from the court to launch a formal investigation. And, and the reason for that, by the way, is because uh, for these types of inquiries, unless it's given, been given to us by the Security Council, there is a procedure put into place to provide judicial oversight over uh, any determination by the prosecutor's office to launch an investigation, a formal investigation, into the crimes. So for our purposes, we'll collect all the information, as we have been, We'll put together a, a dossier and a formal application which we'll submit to the pretrial chamber of the court requesting authorization to launch a formal investigation at which at, point, at that point we'll actually do things such as talk to witnesses and victims. Now I'm, I'm not saying that that's what's going to happen in, in this case, I'm, I'm just saying that's the, the process and procedure. So, so in short, it's, it's really the type of information that the Afghan Human Rights Commission could provide us and other stakeholders can provide us so that we can assess, or to make that assessment, excuse me. And Nima, if, if you were authorized to launch a former investigation and then proceed, uh, what are the real chances that you would be able to apprehend American military leaders, for example, or you know, other foreign forces um, dignitaries. I mean, that's, that's ultimately the million dollar question, I think, as well as the elephant in the room, or whatever other saying that you want to use. Um, I don't know. 
is the, is the honest answer. And I say I don't know because the ICC has no police force. We don't have a military. Um, we rely upon the assistance of national authorities. We rely upon uh, the international community uh, to put pressure on different national authorities in order to apprehend and then to transfer custody over to us of individuals that we believe may be responsible for crimes. So imagine a situation where we decide to in effectively indict or as uh, the, 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 the phrase that we use is uh, issue a document uh, or issue a warrant of arrest effectively for an individual who is a member of the Taliban. Now, no member of my office is going to parachute themselves into northern Afghanistan and then try to apprehend that individual and bring him back to the custody of the ICC. Um, I don't even think we have parachutes. Uh, so, we were gonna, we rely, so ultimately we rely upon individuals in national institutions to do that for us. But then that puts them at risk, and the question becomes whether they're, they're able to do precisely that and then transfer the custody of those individuals to us. Uh, so for instance, one such circumstance where you can see the frustrations and the difficulties surrounding this is the apprehension of Joseph Kony. I think someone that many people in this room are aware of, the, the head of the Lord's Resistance Army in Uganda. Everyone wants to see Joseph Kony brought to justice. Um, I don't know one person who does not want Joseph Kony to be brought to justice. But we can't apprehend him. We can't go into the Congo, grab him and bring him back and put him at trial. And it's very difficult for national authorities to do the same when they put their own soldiers at risk in those scenarios. So all of this depends upon the willingness and the ability of national authorities to assist us. And the same thing goes with international forces that are operating in Afghanistan. I can imagine a situation where it would be particularly difficult if we were to charge an American official for the Americans themselves <coughs> to apprehend and then to transfer that person to our custody when the United States hasn't ratified the Rome Statute at all. I, I can imagine politically, internally politically, that that would be a difficult issue. And I can imagine as a matter of law in the United States, it would be a difficult issue, particularly where immunities exist for political figures in the US government. So for all these, for, for everything that I'm saying, it, 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 you can see the difficulties that surround it. But that's not to say it's impossible. And, and I say that, and I emphasize that, because many people thought when we established the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, that, would, that we would never be able to apprehend Slobodan Milosevic. That, would, that we would never be able to apprehend Radovan Karadzic, the, the president, the former president of the the, the Bosnian Serb government, that we would never be able to apprehend General Radko Mladic. No one thought when we established the ICTY in, in 1990, 1994, 1995, that this would ever happen because they were sitting heads of states at the time. And yet that's precisely what happened. Mind you, it took some time, but it's precisely what happened. So we cannot look at the status quo as an example of things to come or things that will be or to use it as a predictability method. Uh, we can only use our ambitions and what we hope to be and to push things along that way in order to ensure that our court, the ICC, is fully functioning and doing precisely what the international community established it to do, which is prosecute those individuals who are most responsible for the most egregious crimes. If you don't object, let's speculate a little bit here. Um, and well, what about the ICC was able to only trial individuals from the Afghan government uh, or from Afghanistan and not any foreign states because of jurisdiction issues? Uh, what would be your position and, and maybe the Afghan government position towards that? Well, um, as far as it concerns the international forces, uh, there are, you know, many countries in Afghanistan that they have forces. Uh, some of those countries uh, already signed the ICC and their member uh, countries, and some of them have not, and that includes the United States. Uh, any alleged crimes that are uh, committed in Afghanistan, uh, and that's under uh, jurisdiction of ICC, uh, uh, 
that there is one small, uh, a big problem, and that is that Afghanistan government and the United States signed an agreement in 2004 that they would not, you know, charge or submit the inter, uh, U.S. troops uh, to ICC or any other proceedings, and all the power to investigate and uh, put in trial and to prosecute American troops would go to the United States itself. And that was repeated back in, uh, you know, agreements that were signed in 2014 and 2013. Uh, that's allowed by ICC itself as well, I think. And that's, uh, you know, in uh, Article 98, it says that the uh, states, uh, you know, could, not, uh, could sign an agreement with other states to not uh, uh, refer cases to ICC. But our belief is that uh, the ICC jurisdiction would not go away. And still, because that, you know, alleged crimes or incidents or accidents happened in Afghanistan, the ICC would still have the jurisdiction and power to look into these issues and have it, you know, looked into details of those issues. You heard that yesterday there were, uh, or the day before yesterday, the release of 180 photos of torture or uh, inhuman uh, degrading treatments of detainees in Afghanistan and Iraq, and that was released by Pentagon. There is very much, uh, uh, you know, evidence that there were, you know, uh, activities and uh, or uh, uh, behaviors, treatments that could amount to the uh, crimes that is uh, under jurisdiction of the ICC. And that's using the monitoring power, the Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission since 2004, you know, lobbied and advocated for access to background detention centers and all other detention centers around the country to be accessible to the uh, Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission. Unfortunately, that opportunity were not given to us, except that a final agreement that we signed with the uh, uh, American forces in 2010 that we had got access to Parwan detention facility that was a newly built detention facilities and all detainees were brought from Bagram and other places uh, to that Parwan base, which is actually the Bagram uh, detention facilities. So that keep everyone in the dark that the, the bread and the uh, a scope of the uh, uh, you know, commission of uh, torture or other uh, inhuman or uh, uh, degrading treatments of detainees there, let alone the issue of keeping uh, you know, uh, detainees or uh, people under arrest beyond the uh, uh, prescription of law. So that's also an issue that we have repeatedly found in Afghanistan and reported that you know, there are uh, a large number of people uh, detained by either international forces or Afghan forces, and they were kept, you know, uh, in detention facilities without uh, proper trial and beyond the prescription of law. So that kind of issues <laughs> happened in Afghanistan, and I believe though Afghanistan uh, government would not, you know, pursue the risk of, uh, you know, uh, uh, a challenging relationship with the United States, but uh, people were looking for justice, would, uh, hoping that ICC would remain engaged on, on looking at those details and issues that, you know, is evident. And uh, now, by the release of these pictures and photos by Pentagon, I think they also have um, uh, confirmed that some of those uh, uh, actions were committed really there. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> from um, the, the situation that uh, Musa described earlier, mm. and, and again now we understand that there are still crime being committed today in Afghanistan that may uh, be qualified as war crime. Mm. So, as well for the ICC, what is the you know the set date or the limit date that you have now in your preliminary examination? I mean, you mentioned until 2015, but I mean <coughs> the crimes are going on and on. So, what? How, how do you? How do you manage this? Yeah, you know? my, my understanding is that the preliminary examination, because the, so the jurisdiction of the the court, the temporal jurisdiction, uh, begins unless the state itself says it can begin prior to it. 
at the, the date of the ratification of the Rome Statute. So as in, in the case of Afghanistan, it begins in 2003, unless the Afghani government inserts a declaration saying, well, no, you can have jurisdiction for events prior to that, but no more prior than when the statute came into, into place, which is in, in July of 2001. So from that point on, we have jurisdiction. And it, it doesn't get cut off at any point, actually, because it's still a party to the statute. So we would continue to at least have temporal jurisdiction over incidents, even those that are committed to now. But, but temporal jurisdiction and even subject matter jurisdiction, subject matter jurisdiction, which is whether the incident constitutes a crime within the court, is just half of the issue. <laughs> the other half of the issue is this issue of admissibility. Because, and I, and I mentioned this before, we're not a court of first instance. The ICC is intended to complement national prosecutions, national investigations. And so the thing, our examination at least, the thing that the, the part of our court, the part of our office is doing right now with regards to Afghanistan is to determine whether or not there are national investigations into these crimes. So for example, uh, the Department of Justice in the US government has itself conducted an inquiry into the CIA detention centers. The De Department of Defense, which has jurisdiction over the military, has suggested to the Committee of Torture, which is the, uh, the, the UN committee that evaluates torture um, allegations, that it has done over a thousand cases with regards to the treatment of uh, detainees by the US Army. So what, where does that leave us then? I mean, that's something that our office has to evaluate with regards to whether or not the US government is taking its role in terms of investigating and prosecuting individuals within its military and political branch who may be responsible for these crimes. And it's only if we believe, or we have reason to believe, that they're not doing anything, that we will then step in and either, as a positive matter, make recommendations to the US government to do something, or decide to push forward with a formal investigation and prosecution of individuals who we believe to be responsible. That's the stage that we're at with regards to Afghanistan. We're doing a complementarity analysis, which is our national authorities in the Afghan government, our national authorities in the US government, is NATO, because NATO is also involved, such as, for instance, with regards to the um, hospital attack that was mentioned earlier, are they doing uh, something themselves to investigate? And something to keep in mind is if those forces do do an investigation, but determine that actually there's not enough evidence that would suggest that there was a crime committed by those forces, that doesn't necessarily mean for our purposes that, that well, okay, fine, I guess we can now continue with our investigation. It may mean that we do nothing and respect the decision by national forces that there was simply insufficient evidence uh, to continue with a uh, prosecution for, for, those, for those crimes. So it's a, it's a much more complicated matter than yes, there were crimes, thus let's prosecute. We have to look into whether or not the national authorities themselves um, are looking into the matter uh, and what they have determined on the basis of the evidence in which has been presented to them. Well, before we open the floor, I'd like to ask you um, a last question. Um, both our community here at, at NYU and at the EUI are, are very concerned with the current refugee crisis. And, and I really would like to know what's your perception from, from the Afghan side of, of such a situation and, and the response of maybe the, the lack of coherent response uh, being, being made by, by the EU uh, today. Uh, well, Afghanistan is getting uh, a much, much harder place for Afghans to live in peace and security. And uh, there is now, unfortunately, because of the spread of the theater of war everywhere, no places, no single places in Afghanistan that we assume it is safe. It's either, you know, directly there are activities and operations the Taliban conducts, suicide bombing, attacks on, uh, you know, civilians, uh, target killings or hostage takings on the routes, highways of, you know, one province to other province. So pretty much uh, uh, that makes Afghanistan a very difficult place for its citizens to live there uh, and feel security. And that is why it causes 
not only refugees that sent you know people to take refuge in neighboring countries and are as far as coming to Europe, but a very large number of IDPs. Last year, in 2014 and 15, there were 160,000 people internally displaced, and 90-70% of them, 97% of them, were internally displaced because of war and because of conflict in Afghanistan. And that's a huge and challenging number for any countries to deal with it. So because of the lack of capacity, the, the design of the systems to provide any kind of you know, protection uh, or you know, aid deliveries, because the aid delivery, uh, delivery is also very difficult because of the Taliban's activities and anti-government forces activities, they don't allow them to you know, move around and provide food or shelters or other things. So it's getting much harder. And then there are, we, we face uh, you know, uh, the crisis number of refugees that, that is equivalent to the number of internally displaced people. Last year we heard from the you know, multiple sources that over 160,000 Afghans you know, uh, submitted their applications in the developed countries that includes EU and large number of them have access only to the EU, not other countries around the globe, because Australia now closed the, uh, the border by you know, putting a lot of pressure on both people, and the United States and Canada is very far beyond the uh, capacity of any Afghan to travel that way. So that all uh, coming to the uh, Europe, uh, we don't know yet, uh, you know, how they are treated here and how the uh, issue is uh, here. Unfortunately, the only reports that we get is that many, many refugees and people who are seeking refugees and coming to Europe, either they, you know, risk their lives and they are drawn in the. Uh, 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 Turkey water, or they are killed in the Iran-Turkey border, or killed in Afghan-Iran uh, border, because most of them are trying to enter all this territory illegally, and uh, there is no mercy to them by any of those forces in, on those areas. So what we can only receive the reports of dead bodies returned back to Afghanistan, uh, people were drawn into the sea, uh, back to Afghanistan and uh, you know allegations of uh, rape and harassments and sexual exploitation of refugees who are putting their lives uh, in danger, especially uh, children. They are very vulnerable, and you know a big portion of the refugees are children who are either lost their families or their families remained in one the war zone and they could. I get the opportunity to get out of the war zone and you know, couldn't find any place in, in the surrounding areas and then uh, you know, they are uh, preyed upon by uh, predators uh, like you know, uh, uh, traffickers who just you know, uh, uh, make them uh, to believe their, their uh, promises that they would get them safe to Europe or to other countries. So that kind of situation is very, very difficult. And we, we have the, the, the lowest number of returnees last year. Uh, it was around uh, four to 8,000 people returned from Pakistan and Iran. And unfortunately, there, there are also a few hundred people who are forced to leave European countries and deported to Afghanistan, which would put uh, you know, many of their lives in danger in Afghanistan, especially they are coming from the areas that are either not secure, the places, or the way that they commute in between uh, are uh, controlled by Taliban and not safe. And that's why the, we have the so many hostage taking issues. And uh, today we put a statement and release asking for security on the highways because so many people from Bamiyan are very safe place were taken off the buses in Parwan uh, uh, province and taking hostages uh, or killed by, by Taliban. So those uh, routes are very, very insecure, uh, insecure and, and safe for any travelers. 
uh, especially people who are coming from, from those areas. So that's the, the, the kind of situation we, we face there. And unfortunately, uh, we, we are not very familiar with the co a very coherent and very clear policy of the EU. Uh, we hear from different countries that they have different policies. Uh, some of them, you know, try to return Afghanis uh, and deportation. And though it's understandable that the pro pro problem of EU and European countries, it is a humanitarian issue to look at the context and the root causes of this issue that what is uh, uh, causing this uh, influx of refugees and IDPs and that is the continuation of war and the withdrawal of the international troops from Afghanistan exacerbated the situation. It worsened the situation and many believe that if the international community leave Afghanistan there would be better security, better peace. It proved all wrong and now we have much worse a situation in terms of security and safety than we had in 2012 and 2011. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, okay, so we're gonna open the floor for questions. Um, so I get some mic are circulating in the room. Um, hi, my name is Claudia Saracita and I'm a senior here at NYU Florence. Thank you. And I'm also in Professor Lemire's class. Um, so, Nima, you said that um, the ICC relies, pretty much is not the first, works with national governments to make sure that they're, may, how do I put this? So they work with national governments to make sure that they're um, analyzing and making sure that whatever processes, you gave the example of the CIA detention center in the United States, um, that they're analyzing their own, what's the word? Culpability would be the perfect word for it. So um, I guess my question is, at what point does the ICC get involved? So if in the example that you gave with the United States, they do do the entire process of um, holding or making sure that they're holding themselves account accountable, at what point does the ICC say, okay, yes, they've done their due diligence and they have found that they, there was no fault by the country? Or does the ICC at some point say, we do believe that there was a fault even though they said that there was not? Is there a secondary process in which the ICC goes back and says, we don't accept your investigation, and does the ICC then get involved? I mean, that's a good question. Um, before I answer the question, I should have probably gave it, I'm such a bad lawyer. Uh, the opinions, my opinions, are that of myself and not of the ICC or of the office. So I forgot to give that little caveat. And, and knowing that this is going to be published uh, online, it's probably better that I do it now than, than never. Um, getting, getting to your specific question, as to the issue of complementarity, because that's what it gets at. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because um, it's a very difficult question because we haven't necessarily had that situation happen yet. I mean, what we're doing in the, in the situation that I just described before with regards to Afghanistan and particularly the conduct of US forces and other international forces is looking at whether or not they themselves are doing investigations. Now your question gets more specific mm -hmm. which is what if they're doing the investigation they make a determination that there's no culpability but one needs to question whether or not um, th there's good faith in that determination. I mean the rules technically allow us to look at that precise situation. They, they specifically say if a state conducts an investigation for the purpose of shielding the individual. Mm -hmm. So in other words, it's clear that there's, there's an intent behind just looking at the facts and determining whether or not a crime has been committed, but it's done for the purposes of shielding that individual, then complementar complementarity uh, doesn't sh prevent us from conducting an investigation or from taking jurisdiction over the matter. So that's actually carved out um, in the statute itself under Article 17 as an exception to, to the rule. Now, there, are, there is a circumstance right now, actually, in the, in the case uh, with regards to Libya, where we have two accused. We have uh, Mumar al-Sanusi as well as uh, Saif al-Islam, um, who we've charged. The Libyan government has, has agreed to carry out a prosecution against Sanusi, and so we've said, okay, uh, we're not going to exercise jurisdiction of that matter. We'll wait and see as to what's going on with regards to that case and monitor the situation to determine whether or not 
we believe they're actually investigating and prosecuting the crimes for which we believe have been committed or alleged to be committed. Um, so with Sanusi, we, we have a situation where complementarity has kicked in. Mm -hmm. Then we have a situation with Saif al-Islam, who is in the custody of the Zintan militia, which is uh, located in uh, the Zintan area in eastern, in eastern Libya, where we say, hey, listen, uh, even though you're saying you're, you're prosecuting Saif al-Islam, there's, there's a lot of suggestions to believe that there's no right to due process being guaranteed for Saif. He's not really in the custody of the Libyan government. He's in the custody of a, of a militia group. And so therefore, we're not, we're not giving over jurisdiction on this matter on the basis of complementarity. We retain jurisdiction, and we're requesting the Libyan government to transfer him to our authority. Now, obviously, of if, course, they're if and they obviously, do that. yeah. In that situation, if the Libyan government had custody over him, he wouldn't be in the custody of a militia group. So there's a there's a problem there as well. Yeah. So you see complementarity kicking in. Now, the what I think is the interesting thing with regards to Iraq and Afghanistan is that at the end of the day, they're testing the edges of complementarity, right? It's not like the UK government is, is flouting the law and allowing its citizens and soldiers to, uh, to commit acts of violence in detention camps. They have just as much uh, interest in seeing that their soldiers respect the laws of war as we do. And, and because of that, it's it's incumbent upon the court, and the court does work with the UK authorities to see, for instance, if they are actually in good faith investigating such matters, and as a positive matter, working with them to see if, for instance, there's things that we can provide and they can provide us with regards to evaluating the situation. And it's the same thing with, with respect to what's going on in Afghanistan. It truly does test the issue of complementarity, because as I mentioned before, it's not as if, for instance, the United States government is sitting on its hands. It's not as if, for instance, the Afghan government is sitting on its hands. There is something being done by both governments. The question becomes, is enough being done such that uh, we don't exercise jurisdiction over the matter, we don't authorize an investigation due to complementarity, or uh, do we say, no, not enough is being done? And if not enough is being done, then the question becomes, I think, OK, fine, let's go forward with an investigation. Or do we try to persuade national authorities to do more? Because at the end of the day, I think we all get, um, get more out of the fact that our governments do more to prosecute and investigate than the ICC becoming a bigger, uh, larger institution and taking over these matters uh, as a matter of first instance. At the end of the day, these courts are best served to reinvigorate what goes on at the national level than to take the, to the role of national courts and national prosecutors. And quick follow-up question. How much does the pressure from the international community help the ICC in working with national governments? I mean, it's fundamental. Um, and I can just give you an example with regards to what happened at the ICTY, the, the, former, the, the tribunal uh, for the former Yugoslavia. At the end of the day, if you, if, you, if you look at the success rate of the ICTY, which is phenomenal, by the way, I mean, they've been able to apprehend every single individual that they have indicted. Every single person that they have indicted, they've been able to apprehend and to carry a case against. Um, not, I'm not saying they've convicted all of them, but they've at least been able to process cases against all of them. And why is that? Because they had the full backing of the international community. They had the full backing of the European Union, which told national authorities that they will not allow them to join the EU unless there was a clearance provided by the ICTY prosecutor with regards to their cooperation with the court. So I can guarantee you, if any of those states said, no, we're not going to cooperate with you, uh, the ICTY prosecutor would not have gone up to the EU and said, oh yeah, that's good, let them in. No, not at all. There was backing by the Security Council and Security Council me uh, members to also uh, invigorate the ICC, ICTY processes. Uh, so for instance, uh, the ICTY had access to the security and intelligence apparatus of many of the Security Council uh, members uh, in terms of accessing information, accessing where the crimes themselves were committed so that they can carry out an investigation. So the the, the support that was given by the international community 
um, with regards to the crimes that were committed in the former Yugoslavia was, was instrumental in ensuring that the court itself and the office of the prosecutor at the ICTY could carry out, carry out its role. And now look at circumstances where you don't have uh, that international support, and I'm not going to name those now, but you can, you can take a look at them with, with, with regards to some of the cases that we have at the ICC, and you can see that, simply speaking, without the support of the international community, it's very, very difficult to collect evidence, to bring charges, to apprehend individuals, and to carry out a trial in a fulsome way. So, uh, you know, if you, if you want to talk about the most important thing in terms of the success and failures of these trials, that is the most important thing, which is the support of the international community. Okay, um, my name is Varun, and I am a freshman. Um, my question was about the, um, the amnesty um, agreement that was... Law. Law. Yes. The amnesty law that was um, in Afghanistan. Now, I mean, who does that protect or who was that in written or created for like, preventing to get acquitted? Uh, the amnesty law was uh, initiated by a uh, uh, strong... Uh, Mujahideen bloc, uh, uh, those who were in uh, parliament at the time, uh, because uh, to shielding and protecting them against uh, prosecution or allegations that they committed war crimes during the uh, fighting, uh, in fighting in Afghanistan civil war, which was uh, a period of 1992 until 1995 and during the Taliban time, uh, 1995 to 2001. Because at the time there were, uh, you know, in Afghanistan parliament, uh, MPs from all three eras, you know, from the Soviet uh, Union invasion eras that the communist regimes, and Mujahideen, and Taliban, representative of Taliban. So they put a blanket amnesty to everyone who involved in committing atrocities, human rights violations, and war crimes in Afghanistan. So that is actually a blanket to everyone, a blanket amnesty offered to everyone who were engaged in war and committed atrocities and violations of human rights. Good evening. <laughs> My name is Luisa Vierucci, and I'm a professor of international law at the University of Florence. So thank you very much to both speakers. Um, in fact, I have a question each, uh, I think. Uh, first, uh, starting from uh, Nima. Huh? So um, I'm very interested in the, uh, having more details about the examination your office is, curr is currently conducting uh, concerning Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And in particular, uh, I wonder if you can tell us something more concerning uh, the examination uh, of, uh, on the conduct of foreign troops uh, in Afghanistan. Because uh, if I understood you correctly, you only mentioned in respect to foreign uh, troops uh, that you are actually examining uh, the uh, conduct, their conduct in deten detention centers. But you didn't mention anything concerning the conduct of hostilities. Uh, yeah, the, conduct of what? the conduct of hostilities, oh, hostilities. the way okay. hostilities, yeah. um, which you did with respect to the Taliban and the government forces. You explicitly mentioned targeted killings mm -hmm. and disproportionate attacks. So I wonder whether there was, you know, an omission, an omission, or actually there is no investigation. Or by contrast, if there is no investigation on those uh, types of uh, acts uh, allegedly committed by the international forces. Yeah, I, can only, I can only say this. I can say, even though, as a matter of, well, uh, first I'll backtrack. First, the, in terms of the conduct that we're, we're looking at and that conduct that we're able to tell the public about, that's all contained in detail in our 2014 and 2015 report on preliminary examinations. And the language in those reports is actually quite specific, which is it says that this isn't intended to be the only conduct that we're looking at. So it's not limited just to the conduct that described, that's described in our, in our public report and that the office has the right and reserves the right to open up and request an examination, I'm sorry, an investigation into much broader conduct. 
Um, so I'll, I'll say that. But in terms of what is detailed in the report and, and specifically articulated, it does relate to detention centers that are under the custody and control of international forces. Now, there, there, there might be, and I'll only speculate at this, uh, at least to this, uh, because of the jurisdictional limitation of where the jurisdiction of, of the court starts, which is in 2003. Because, and I say this because if you look at, for instance, the participation of international forces in terms of conflict in Afghanistan, it's predominantly occurring in 2001 and beyond when the US government post 9-11 decided to launch attacks and up until roughly around 2003 prior to the institution or the acceptance of jurisdiction of the court. So that's where you have the highest frequency in terms of US conduct in terms of hostilities. I'm not saying that's the reason, but I'm saying that's some context to keep in mind. But I will re-emphasize that the report itself focuses on the detention centers, but is not limited and makes it express that it's not limited to only that. And um, my other question concerns the um, actually the probability of uh, reaching an agreement between the government and Taliban forces. You mentioned, but only in passing, that this the, the uh, eventual uh, exam not examination but an investigation of the ICC is not necessarily well perceived uh, in Afghanistan because it might have that it might be to go to the detriment of actually of, uh, of a negotiation of peace with the Taliban. I don't know if you can tell us more about the actual possibilities of such an agreement being reached because we have been you know, hearing about it for, <laughs> for many years without, as far as I know, any actual results. Uh, well, thank you very much. Um, that's uh, very important questions and uh, that question actually uh, preoccupies uh, Afghanistan uh, and our citizens' minds and civil society and activists and human rights uh, and women rights uh, uh, defenders. Uh, whether we would reach an agreement with Taliban, uh, if we reach uh, an agreement with Taliban at what cost would the government of Afghanistan or the international community would relinquish uh, on you know, the past achievements that we have made in Afghanistan. Uh, what about the constitution of Afghanistan? What about the women rights in Afghanistan? What about human rights in Afghanistan? What about child, children rights in Afghanistan? What about you know, minority safety and security in Afghanistan? And how about justice? If you look only you know, on the number of civilian casualties from 2008 up to 2000, for 2015, over 39,000 uh, people, you know, civilian casualties in number registered by the IHRC. And, and that includes over 16,000 people killed by, you know, uh, incidents that over 75% of them Taliban uh, or anti-government forces were involved. So that issue is uh, a fundamental issue for everyone in Afghanistan because Yes, peace is a necessity and a need, and without peace, human rights protection or any other work would not be done. At the same time, what cost we would pay for, for reaching peace with a group that would not respect any international value, any international norms, any Afghan law or norms or values, and they have done everything that were possible uh, at their disposal with their you know, political and uh, you know, regional supporters. The possibility of reaching that agreement uh, is not you know, that vivid at the moment. However, uh, yesterday uh, they announced that they have reached a roadmap of course, at this very moment, there, is ne there are negotiations between Afghanistan and Pakistan under, uh, you know, with the support of the United States and, and China. Afghanistan government position preliminary, the fundamental position is that we will not give up on the constitution of Afghanistan, on the achievements that we have made in the past, and on human rights and women rights, and these would be red lines for us. However, you know, there are very limited uh, and very little uh, faith on the promises and the commitments of Afghanistan government 
because what is vivid that Afghan government has been under extremely uh, strong pressure both at the uh, theater of war because the Taliban have been very active in different areas uh, posing attacks and uh, you know operation against government forces and second the international community is it is seemed to us that it's more and more disengaged from Afghanistan and viewing other areas of the world, you know, more at their interest. So they want us, uh, they want the government of Afghanistan to reach a, a, a peace agreement. So there is not only an, an uh, element of Afghan governments, uh, but the international community as well. However, the worry remains there that what would happen to ju uh, justice? What would happen to human rights? How, what would happen to women rights? Because this, these are the issues that Taliban would not, you know, submit to. And they are a force that, you know, they are brutally uh, treat women. They just, uh, uh, you know, a woman, her head, uh, her nose was uh, uh, cut off by her husband. And apparently her husband was a, a Taliban member and he fled to Taliban and no one can prosecute uh, her. Uh, they were, you know, condemning women uh, to adultery or uh, immoral, uh, you know, relationship, and they just stoning them there. Uh, they are killing a ten-year uh, ch child and uh, using a lot of children in a suicide bomber in Afghanistan. They are poisoning ch uh, school of, uh, you know, uh, that girls attend and burning those schools and say that you should not attend, uh, you know, schools and, uh, and it's prohibited uh, for women in their areas that Taliban has access or influence there. So that, that, those policies, active policies of Taliban is still a very real concern for every individual in Afghanistan. And that makes us suspicious about politics in that part of the world and, you know, at the global level as well, because there are always justice and human rights could be compromised in the interest of, you know, a myopic short-term uh, uh, peace process or peace uh, negotiation, or, you know, ceasefire, let's say, because peace would not mean only end of uh, hostility or uh, cessation of fire. Hi, I'm Isabel, I'm a freshman. Um, I'm just wondering, how do you cope with the frustration of being stuck in all the procedural minutia of um, your legal examination, especially knowing that at the end of the day, the UN and the ICC don't have the power of enforcement? Uh, I don't mind the legal minutia, actually. Um, legal minutia is what I do uh, as, as a lawyer, especially on procedural matters. But no, I, the legal minutia I think you're referring to is the, the this different stages that we have before a case can go from uh, the examination stage up until a, a trial prosecution. And, and that was obviously deliberately provided by the, by the framers of the, of the Rome Statute for a number of reasons. One is you, you, you ostensibly need a preliminary examination stage at a court, at an institution like the ICC. You cannot take every case to investigation. It, just, it would be impossible, um, especially if you have to look at every single allegation and then make a determination as to whether or not to investigate you simply cannot take all of those allegations and conduct an investigation uh, do just the sheer numbers. I mean, you have, I think, something along the lines of hundreds of inquiries for an investigation uh, delivered to us on a weekly basis. So imagine if we were evaluating and doing an investigation into each of those, uh, each of those allegations, it, it, would, it would hamstring the court from doing anything. And so that's why you have to have a preliminary examination stage in order to filter the types of situations out to be able to determine which one of those meets the various requirements of subject matter jurisdiction, personal jurisdiction, temporal jurisdiction, as well as admissibility before deciding to launch a, a formal investigation. So it, those minutiae were deliberately provided and, they, and they, frankly they make sense, I think, for, given the nature of the court. Um, in terms of I think the frustrations you're probably getting at, which is the frustrations of support by the international community, um, at least for myself, I can only say I don't put the cart before the horse, which is until, I, I, until there's a circumstance where I can tell the international community is not assisting on a case that I'm dealing with, I'm not taking for granted that the international community is not going to assist us. And I think as an office, 
I think we, have, we are evaluating cases on the basis of the evidence and the facts presented before us and not on the basis of political considerations that may or may not bear out. Frankly, yeah, I, I, as, as direct as I can get to you, which is our responsibilities as prosecutors is not to take into consideration political matters and whether or not we can apprehend an individual who is or rightfully subject to our jurisdiction, but rather to make an evaluation on the basis of law and the facts presented before us. So those frustrations may inevitably hamper our ability to carry out trials and investigations, but they don't hamper the resolve of either the office, from what I, from what I personally have seen, nor the resolve of the court to, to do what it's been established to do. My name is Weber, I'm a sophomore. Um, what do you do in situations where you have sufficient knowledge of war crimes taking place in areas where you have no jurisdiction? That's a, that's a good question. I mean, there's very, it's very difficult to do anything in those circumstances. Uh, because at the end of the day, uh, it's not as if we can go into situations where we don't have jurisdiction and conduct an investigation. And it's also not, as, it's not a situation in which we really can opine upon, given the deliberate decision by that state or the nationals who are involved, to not agree to the court. So at least from from, and I could be absolutely wrong, but at least to my knowledge, our, our institution has not opined on those issues yet. And left that to the decisions of uh, the international community to determine what actions it should take in those circumstances. So one such example I think, uh, which is discussed a lot, is the uh, circumstances in, in North Korea. Our court doesn't have jurisdiction over North Korea, unless the Security Council decides to refer the matter to our court, in which case we would have jurisdiction over whatever, whether or not crimes are being committed in North Korea. So in those circumstances, it's not really up to us to say anything or to do anything. The responsibility is on the international community to decide what steps it should take and whether or not it should include international prosecution and investigation. I'm Sasha from, no, um, I'm a freshman. I won't hold that against you. <laughs> Um, how do you decide what makes um, targeted killings compared to collateral damage? I mean, it's mostly, a, I mean, it's obviously an evidentiary matter. Um, and it all revolves around the information that we have presented before us. But the primary inquiry that you would look at is whether or not there's a military target in terms of whether or not it's clear, basis, on the basis of information that we have, that the target uh, that was trying to be attacked was a military target, and if it wasn't, whether or not the attack on the non-military target was deliberate, in which case it would be a targeted killing. So it all depends on, it depends on a number of things. It can depend on, on things such as, for instance, the, the nature of the artillery used. So for instance, if I'm dropping a, a, a bomb in, a, in, a, in an area where there's clearly a military target, then probably the analysis is going to be more upon disproportionate attack than on a targeted killing. On the other hand, if it's a sniper attack and the persons being <coughs> killed are civilians, women and children, politicians, individuals who have no relationship, for instance, with, with the conduct of hostilities, then that's more clearly an incident of a targeted killing than a, a disproportionate attack. So it's, it all depends on the, on the factual matrix that we have and, the, and the, the information that we have available to us in terms of the character of the attack itself like the weapons used, the orders that were issued, and so on. Hi, my name is Helen. I'm a freshman here at um, Florence. Um, my question is for Musa, which is, you've talked about these astounding number of atrocities that's happened in Afghanistan and Iraq. And in your opinion, at which point do you think countries all over the world will put aside their political complications with one another and realize that this is not only a war amongst people in the Middle East, but a war on humanity. And then they decide that we have, we have our differences, but this is the number one priority. When, what do you believe and what's your opinion that, that at that point we'll start doing well, something about it? Thank you very much. That's a very good and fundamental question for everyone to ponder around and uh, ask it. Uh, I think uh, there are a lot of uh, flaws in the international system that we now live in and that's whether it's you know uh, from international law point of view or from you know 
political point of view or from international relations point of view. Uh, because we don't have a perfect world and without a super legal uh, structure uh, that punishes uh, or bring those to uh, justice that commits this kind of uh, war or breaches uh, and violates uh, international law. So that's one thing. And the second is that uh, countries are spinning around their own national interest, not necessarily the interest of humanity or interests of those who suffer from, you know, conduct of uh, protecting or supporting the national interest of one country. The third is that uh, the lack of belief in, in the international, however insufficient and inadequate uh, system that is, uh, you know, created especially in the 20th centuries uh, until now. So countries insecure and are wanting for expansion of their power and influence and reach and other things, they uh, don't really believe in the current international system. So until and unless otherwise we've, we try to make sure that the international system works perfectly and the uh, structures like ICC would find a, a weight and uh, um, uh, a role, the things would continue like this and uh, uh, the plight of Afghanistan would be on the interest of one country and the plight of Syria would be, uh, people would be in the interest of some other countries and the uh, misery of Iraqis would be in the interest of other countries and then there would be a lot of uh, national interest and international interest of regional super uh, and global powers who are supporting each others and there are issues of energy and the issue of oil and the issue of so many other things uh, that are there. But let me also uh, tell you one thing that we never learn our lessons as well uh, at the global stage. Uh, war in Afghanistan started in uh, 1978. Uh, the world rushed in to help Afghan Mujahideen to you know, fight Soviet Union. And then in 1992, we were left uh, abandoned completely and there were no you know, attention to Afghanistan. And then it became a place for breathing a lot of other troubles for the, the country and uh, let the countries to be abandoned to the hand of you know, Pakistan and other regional powers. And then we, we suddenly find out ourselves in a global war that everyone is fighting against everyone and we are the victim. Could you believe that 37 years of war in a country, everyone, you know, around 40, they have lived their entire life through conflict. So that is something that, you know, in Afghanistan happened and it's going to happen elsewhere in Syria and Iraq. And unfortunately, the national interest of many countries would not allow them to prevent that. And there are ide radical ideologies that are spread, you know, even now by uh, many and supports of and logistics of countries who have interest in, the, in that region. And no one is going to stop that until we have a, you know, a perfect system and you know, champions of uh, human rights and justice that force the countries and, 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 and the things. Otherwise, I wouldn't have any, 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 uh, any answer. And, uh, uh, but my inspiration and my hope and my uh, thing, like as a, as a person who lived the entire lifetime under war and conflict, fleeing from one city to another city, not even leaving the country, but living under that would be that just, you know, there are perfect situation that anywhere that a country is under oppression, under, you know, uh, difficulties like this, countries around the world come together and, and address those, uh, those uh, problem, but not to compete against each other or use that against each other's interest. Hi there, I'm Suli. I'm a sophomore. I have a question for Mr. Nima. So I'm sure most of us are aware of human rights violations within Afghanistan, whether anti-government or pro-government. I think it's common in many third world countries. 
And these issues often surface in mainstream media. So my concern is, my, and my question is, do you get much cases of human rights violation for, with, um, from British troops or American troops? Do we get human rights violation cases about, from British, uh, concerning British and American troops? Yes, with, in Afghanistan. Um, well, not, okay, well, I'll use a more precise word. Do we get, a, do we get allegations of crimes? Because remember, we're a criminal court, not a human rights court. That's not a problem. Obviously, we have, because that's why we're conducting an examination into the conduct of US forces, in addition to the conduct of other forces um, in Afghanistan. Now, as it, as it relates to, obviously, I've, I've specifically looked at the conduct of international forces with regards to detention centers, as we, we had discussed. And with regards to Iraq, it's the conduct of UK forces. Um, but that's not to say that other forces have not committed crimes. But because of jurisdictional limitations, we, can, we only look at the conduct of UK forces in Iraq. Uh, obviously, we have a broader latitude with regards to Afghanistan because we have territorial jurisdiction. Um, but in terms of the information that we received and what we're doing, it's primarily been focusing on the conduct of international forces such as the United States in, in detention centers. I'm sorry if that doesn't answer your question in, in full, um, because it's difficult it's difficult in many ways for me to answer that question because, because we obviously get information about everything. I mean, if you think about it, we're getting information from a variety of stakeholders, some credible, some not so credible, with regards to the conduct of probably every single institution and force uh, currently operating and previously operating in Afghanistan. So in short, the answer to your question is obviously yes, we are giving information. Now, is that information credible? That's an assessment that's conducted by our office before determining whether or not to launch a formal investigation. I'm Sadiksha, uh, sophomore, and my question is for uh, Musa. So I think it's safe to say that most Afghani people are anti-Taliban, but uh, uh, for a, a common Afghani human, what are their sentiments towards the government at the moment? And s for people who have like lived their entire war, li life through war, if they might compare when the Taliban was in power versus now, and which was less worse, like what are the sentiments like? Well, I, I should uh, tell you that uh, there are a lot of flaws with the current government of Afghanistan. Uh, there are failures uh, with regard to the government of Afghanistan and people you know, complaining and, you know, uh, showing that sentiments against the government of Afghanistan every day. And they are, uh, uh, you know, sick and tired of corruption, sick and tired of, you know, lack of service delivery by the government, sick and tired of, you know, incapability and lack of capacity of the current government of Afghanistan to provide security and safety. Uh, and to do anything for uh, to citizens of Afghanistan for Afghan citizens, uh, I you know in terms of good education, uh, health, anything that's you know uh, a responsibility of government, justice, and uh, protecting them against uh, uh, brutalities and, in, uh, and injustices and, and arbitrary uh, actions of, of those in power. So these these are expectation from the government that unfortunately the government fail them every day, every single day, a day of uh, Afghan citizens. However, I must say that most of Afghan people, because they lived through Taliban oppression, through Taliban, you know, the government, through Taliban uh, uh, discriminatory uh, policy, they dislike Taliban. And that's why you see that every poll that shows that, you know, with Though, although the Afghan government is corrupt, uh, incapable, uh, without the capacity, uh, the Afghan government say that's okay, we will choose that. That is evident in the election 2014, that despite the Taliban threatened Afghans to cut their hands off, and actually they did, they cut off the fingers of Afghan men and women, they went to uh, election pools to, to cast their vote for Afghan government. So that's, that's the reality of Afghanistan. Yes, the government of Afghanistan is capable, corrupt, you know, they have a lot of flaws. Taliban would never be an alternative, would never be something that go, uh, Afghan government would choose them over the current government of uh, the, the government of Afghanistan. 
because at least at the moment they can uh, you know put their protest you know peacefully out there They're, they can have their voice out by free media you know civil society uh, through uh, uh, freedom of expression, uh, freedom of association, freedom of assemblies, freedom of movements uh, in the part that you know relates to the, the government of Afghanistan. Under Taliban, there wouldn't be anything as, uh, like that. There would be only, you know, their response would be bullets and, uh, and, uh, and killing. And look at the situation of women. Although women are, you know, restricted because of insecurity, because of uh, ongoing war, and they are bearing the brunt of all kind of you know tragedies today of war, uh, you know, uh, drought, uh, natural disasters, air poverty, everything. But they can uh, live in a in under uh, government of Afghanistan, allowed to go to work, allowed to go to you know uh, attend the schools, allowed to have you know their rights be. Uh, signed the CEDA, Afghanistan government signed CEDA, Afghanistan government signed into decree the EVA law which protects women against violence against women uh, and also a lot of improvements on, on, on children uh, situation, a lot of improvement on legal issues and one of the issues that relates to the ICC uh, complementary issues in Afghanistan it's that you know the capacity of judiciary in Afghanistan is so low that even though they want to do and persecute people, they cannot do it. They are in, uh, incapable to, to do that and they don't have that capacity. There are no legal you know, uh, provisions uh, as such that uh, they can implement or uh, apply uh, provisions of ICC unless otherwise we would go to uh, incorporate that in, into our domestic law because we are a dualist system in terms of uh, uh, legal approach. So those kind of uh, issues are there. We, we, we want to, uh, uh, the Afghan government want to uh, 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 have that capacity, but Taliban would never be an alternative. Neither, are, uh, you know, a, now uh, a started uh, trend that, you know, we, they called it they are Daesh and, and uh, in, in uh, and the international level ISIS. They would not be uh, a choice for Afghans unless otherwise they can conquer all Afghanistan by force and force Afghans to, to live under their uh, uh, oppression. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think that was very clear. Well, let's thank our guests, please.